show. I'm covering my Stephen Benu. You're watching Israeli News Live. And friends, I really need to talk to you very seriously to, Seriously, today. We're going back once again into this uh, project that we've been doing, What Have Rabbis Missed? And Rabbinical Brethren, if you are watching this message today, I encourage you, please take the time. Listen to what I'm going to share with you today because I think it's critical as we see the trouble that we are in all around the borders of Israel, wars being fought on every side right now, the tensions that are mounting, and the government is so uh, concerned about the wars that are on our borders and everything that they have no time to search the scriptures. And in the rabbinical community there in Israel, I know that it is day and night that the scriptures are being searched. There is always uh, someone, some of the righteous of Israel that are praying there at the Wailing Wall uh, in keeping in, in, the, in the commemoration of Abraham when he asked the Lord would he destroy the city if there were ten righteous. So there's always ten righteous souls praying, or supposed to be righteous souls, praying there at the Wailing Wall, uh, very concerned because of this destruction that's at hand on every side. And so I, I want to speak to you as well, my Christian friends, uh, tonight we're going to be going into redemption, and this is something that many of you have heard before, but what you're going to hear tonight, though, is going to be insights you've never heard before, and so I really want to encourage you to listen carefully as we go through this, and I've got to share some very important things here. Uh, also, it might help also an answer one of the comments that a friend left with us here about Adam and Eve and the tree of life and saying that they never partook of the tree of life as of yet, that it was guarded. So we're going to kind of touch on that basis as well. So, and if you have blogs, if you have a website, if you want to write an article about, again, this particular video and backlink, IsraeliNewsLive.org, please do so. Uh, share it everywhere you possibly can in, in forums with our Jewish friends, uh, with, even for Jews for Jesus, who also have a great outreach trying to reach our Jewish brothers and sisters around the world. If you know people in Israel, sh send it to them, share it with them, everything we possibly can, because this is for helping our brothers and sisters to recognize indeed who is the Mashiach, who's the Messiah. So let's get right into this. It's very interesting, very interesting about the redemption process here. And I am so excited to get to share this with you tonight. We're going to start here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, now I'm going to kind of stop right there because there's a couple of things we're going to kind of touch on right here. One, uh, how that God, when he breathed into Adam's nostrils, he becomes a living soul. And also we want to look at the tree of, of life here. Uh, we do know that later in the chapter here, God is going to command uh, around verse 17 that they do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, there is no command whatsoever that they do not eat from the tree of life. But we also have no record that most people can see with the eyes that they ever ate of the tree of life. And we know that after the fall, then, you know, God says uh, we must, you know, guard the way of the tree of life, lest the man put forth and, and take of the tree of life and live forever. All right? Now, I'm going to shake you up just a little bit, but this is part of redemption, so please bear with me and listen closely. So let's back up here. Let's first look at the man and the way God makes him. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, in English, you don't quite catch the fullness of this, so we're going to take a look at this. Ve'yitzar Adonai Elohim et... Ha'adam, and I'm going to use Adonai in the case of the Tetragrammaton yod heh vav -Hey, for the sake of the rabbinical brethren that might be listening, because friends, listen to me, my Christian brothers, I love you. Sisters, I love you. But you have to understand, many of them would just shut the video off if I dare try to pronounce the yod heh vav -Hey. So for the sake of those Jews that will be listening, let's please have a little respect there and understanding there while we try to reach this situation or deal with this situation here. So anyway, so it says here, 
ויצר אדוני אלוהים את האדם, אפר מן האדמה, אוקיי? Okay? And the Lord God had formed the man from, from the earth, the dirt, the ground, the mud, whatever you want to call it. ואיפק בפאב נשמר חיים, all right? And he breathes into his nose, all right? נשמת חיים, okay? נשמר חיים. Now notice it's in the plural, חיים. That's God's own life, all right? That's also the חיים is the very fruit from the tree of life. All right, like, like for example, if you were to take an apple, all right, this apple right here comes from an apple tree. The life that is in the apple tree is in the apple. And you can't get an orange out of the apple tree. But the apple that came off the apple tree has got the exact same life, same DNA as the tree itself. All right, so let's take a look at something. If we scroll down a little bit, we're going to come back to this part in just a second with Adam. We find here the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden. All right, it's right here. Ve'etz, ha, there's your definite article, hey, like saying the, all right. Ve'etz, ha, chayim, the tree of life. And again, it's exactly chayim. In other words, it's an apple. It's a fruit. I'm not saying that the tree of life is an apple tree, okay? So please don't get that mixed up. They already think that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is an apple tree, which is nonsense. But nonetheless, that's what they think, all right? But the point is, is look, let's see if we can do this to where you can see them both. Okay, yes, we can. If you look at the top of the screen, screen, God breathes into his nostrils, ipak bepa'av nishmar chayim, all right? He breathes in that life, chayim. The tree of life is Chaim. The same life that is in the tree of life is already been breathed into Adam and Eve. Who do you think came and breathed it into him? The tree of life. And he breathed, Ipak bepa'av nishmar Chaim. The tree of life itself breathed in that life into him. He has the apple, in other words. He has that life in him, the same life that the tree of... What do you think the tree of life is going to bear? What kind of fruit do you think it's going to bear? Chaim, life. Now, the other interesting thing is, too, is that lanefesh, and to the soul, haya. In other words, that man becomes a living soul singular. His life, just for him, is chaya, singular. But God put in him chayim in a plural. Why? Because Eve's in him. Don't you remember when God created him in Genesis 1? He created them, plural, both male and female. So you see, when Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, both Adam and Eve were in the same body. This is why you never see that God has to breathe in her, Chaim, because she is a living soul when she's taken from Adam. Now, God puts them into a deep sleep, right? Now, if you go down to verse 17, this is where we find out about the command of what you can eat. Let's look at verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge and good of, of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Says so nothing about not being able to eat from the tree of life. But he doesn't have to eat from the tree of life. He's already got that fruit within him. So does his wife. But why is it then that, that there's this big issue about the needing of the Messiah? The Messiah is going to be a tree of life when he is born. And I'm going to prove that to you today by the word of Almighty God. And that's something, rabbis, that I bet you haven't really thought about yourself. That lay right inside of the very holy writings of God Almighty tells us that the tree of life will be born. That's a new one, isn't it? Hmm. Bet you can't wait to get there. All right. So anyway, God says for them to not to eat the tree of, of, of knowledge of good and evil. All right? So we know that. But here's where the trouble comes in, though. If God says later after the fall, 
guard the tree of life, lest a man put forth his hand and he, and he, and he partake of the tree of, uh, of life and live forever. He's talking about the descendants of Adam and Eve because why? Their children would be born, but not with the tree of life, not with the life within them because they're in a fallen nature. They're in a fallen state. Let me show you something else that Adam and Eve have. Let's go down to verse 23. This is going to be interesting as well. Uh, and it make some of the Christians really think when it comes to the time of the day of Pentecost, right? As far as from Christian beliefs, all right? Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he uh, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right. Now, brothers, let me tell you something. That doesn't make her subordinate. That doesn't make her a lesser being. She has the exact same life that Adam has. When the fall happens in the Garden of Eden, she falls, he falls. They're both fallen. They both need redemption. They're all their children that would ever be born on the earth would need redemption as well. All right? And in fact, the Word of God, we find out in Genesis that she sins not willfully, but unwillfully. Whereas he does it willfully. I know some people like to try to say, well, Adam's a type of Christ. He did it willfully in order to be able to save his wife. That sounds nice. It really does. And I appreciate that. I'm not against it, but I will say this. If it truly was that he was doing this as a redemptive uh, measure, which he had no ability to redeem her, then he should have done it the other way around and said, first off, he would not partake of it. That would have been the only way he could have redeemed his wife. Secondly, what Adam should have done was not accused his wife. Because when God comes to them, he says, the woman you gave me, she did it. He was afraid, and, and understandably so. He's afraid. He sinned. He sinned willfully. She did it in ignorance. All right, but let's, let's get to the point here, though. All right, now, this is what I want to share with you, though. It's very interesting in this. And the flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. All right? Now let's get where we're at here. Do -do 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 -do. Here we go, right? Isha. Ikara Isha. She shall be called woman. Isha. Ki me'esh lakach zot. Okay, why? Because... From the Ish or the man, this is not from Adam, by the way, she was taken. Now that's interesting. That's, gonna, that's going to totally change your whole way of thinking right here. She's not taken mean from Adam. She's not taken from the man, the clay figure of the man, but she's taken from the Ish of the man. Now, this is very interesting, and I'm going to blow it up really big for you guys because I need you to be able to see this, all right? Because I know that's some small, so let's go all the way up to 500. And now we've got to go all the way back down here to where we're at here. That's verse 23, I believe, or 24, something like that. Okay, yeah, here we go. Now you guys can see this a little bit better, all right? Ika, and she will be called... Isha, Aleph Shin He. All right. Now bring it up a little bit higher. And why? Because ki because meesh lakach zot. Because she was taken from. Now they translate this man Aleph Yod Shin, but this is literally. If you want to look at the compound complexity of this. Take the yod out for just a moment and you have ash, fire. Same thing with her, ash, fire. But take the middle letter, the yod, and the last letter for her name, the he, now you have yah, you have God. So God doesn't take from min adam, not from the man. It's not so much from the flesh, even though we read, they say the word is the rib. It literally in Hebrew is from the side. There's something from the side that God takes from this man, but it's not from the Adama, it's from the Ish. It's from the fire of God. And he makes Isha, another fire of God. 
And what's so beautiful about this is this is exactly what we see on the day of Pentecost in the Christian beliefs there. When they say that there was a fire, there was the Spirit of God comes down, the Ruach HaKodesh comes down, and it rests upon each one of these apostles that are in this upper room, and it was like unto a fire. What do you know? The Aish. But it's not just any kind of Aish. It is the fire of God. It is the restoring back what is lost. Now, Adam and Eve had Chaim, but we are born into this world without it. Because why? We've not been able to partake of that fruit unless that tree of life comes into this world and does the redemption work in order to give us back that which we are lacking, that which we are missing. Adam and Eve forfeited it. All right, we'll find out how that happened. Let me break this back down so it's easier for people to see, though, here in just a second. Let's go to Genesis 3. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? All right, Adam's already blamed her in the verses above. And, and uh, the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou among all cattle and among all the beasts of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. All right? Now, and I will put enmity, which is hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and they shall bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise their heel. All right? Now, King James literally puts that in the singular. If she shall bruise your head, and you, and you shall bruise his heel. And I think it's more of the singular to begin with as well. But here's what's interesting, though. They try to say the woman doesn't have a seed. That seed, friends, is speaking directly of the Messiah himself. The seed that she would have would be a child. All right? The tree of life will actually have to come into being, into a human being. A child will have to be born. All right, now, let me just show you some other things real quick before we move on. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain and thy travail. In pain thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. All right, first off, the ruling over you is not a wonderful gift that God has given Adam for willfully sinning. It is because he has fallen. He has lost that spirit of God of direct direction. And so, therefore, in a fallen state, he doesn't know how to treat his wife. So he rules over her. And this whole idea that you will greatly multiply thy pain and thy travail, and in pain thou shalt bring forth children, it doesn't say that either. Not exactly. The pain and the sorrow is pain of heart, and a travailing, one causes her grief, one causes her sorrow, and it's because why? You shall birth what? Teladai banim. You shall birth sons. And God knew that one was going to kill the other. One would cause her pain, the other would cause her sorrow. The sorrow, in other words, mourning. The pain because Cain did a wicked, evil thing to his brother. That pained her heart. The sorrow of mourning because her other child would be killed. She would birth boys, sons. All right? That's just a little one I'll throw in there for you. Now, Let's move on. I want to share with you something now. We're going to get into this part about redemption. So let's jump over to Jeremiah chapter 2. Okay? We're going to begin here with verse 6. Neither said they, Where is the Lord? This is, Israel's already gone long down the, down the way. All right? Jeremiah's here. Moses has already come. Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, the children of Israel have been born which we'll jump back to that in a moment. But we're going to look at something that the prophet Jeremiah spoke uh, in chapter 2. Let me back up to verse 5 here. We want to kind of set the stage just for a moment here. Thus saith the Lord, What unrighteousness have your fathers found in me, that you are gone far from me, and have walked after things that are not and are become not, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, through a land of desert and of pits, though 
uh, through a land of drought and shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. I'm going to show you something here. When he says, I brought you into a land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof. The reason why God brought the children of Israel to the land that we call Israel today, to the promised land, is because this is where the Messiah would come. This is where redemption would come. This is the very land that God knew from the beginning of time that his righteous branch would be born. Again, the righteous branch, as we read in Jeremiah as well, is a reflection of what? The tree of life. The Eitz Chaim. All right? The priest said, Not where is the Lord? This is, what, this is what gets me right here. The priest said, Not where is the Lord? Now see, God tells you, brings you up to a fruitful field and to, a fruit, uh, and, and to eat the fruit thereof and the good of thereof. But when you entered in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said, Not where is the Lord? What does eating the fruit got to do with where is the Lord? Everything. Everything. All right, and they that handled the law knew me not, and the and the rulers transgressed against me. The prophets also prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Let me tell you something, rabbinical brethren. You were supposed from the very beginning to be pointing Israel to the coming of the Mashiach. The prophets all wrote about it. Everyone were trying to tell you that he was coming in different ways. Not just the prophets, so were the Navim, the Kotavim. In the Kotavim, you also find the coming of the Mashiach. Moses said, the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto me. And we have, we have sages that also agree that the Mashiach and the prophet like unto me are one and the same. I know that there are sages that say it's not so, but there are also other rabbinical scholars that say that it is so. And nonetheless, even if you looked at nothing else but the mere fact that the Messiah was to come before the destruction of the second temple, where is he at? Where is redemption? Watch what, watch what Jeremiah says to you. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over to the isles of the Ketites and see and send unto Kedar and consider diligently and see if there hath been such a thing. Hath the nation changed its gods, which you yet are no gods, but my people, people hath changed its glory from that which doth not profit? Be astonished, O you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be you exceedingly amazed, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water <laughs> what kind of water is that mayim chayim water that has the same fruit as the tree of life you have forsaken the Lord God, which is a fountain of living water. God himself is the tree of life. He is a fountain of living water. He can breathe that into your body like he did Adam as well. Isn't it interesting that the human being is what, 90% water? Hmm, think about that for a moment. All right, now, I said to you that I'm going to show you that the tree of life would be born. Let's look at this next. This is a scripture in Proverbs that, by the way, most people look at the English translation and still don't get it right. And I know there's a lot of people, I really, I appreciate you. I love you. I use the King James Bible myself and there's a lot of people that say, King James is, is perfect translation. They were all anointed of the Holy Spirit and we don't need anything else. You don't have to add or take away from it. All right? I appreciate you and I love you, but let me tell you something. You're going to totally miss 
If you just try to use this with the Jewish people, you will never get them to Christ. I'm not saying that there won't be some, but for the most part, you won't. Because God has hidden in the original language itself. He's hidden the Messiah written right in there. So this is, and again, like I said, I use King James faithfully day and day in and day out. But I also continually go back to that original language because it's what my people read. Every Jew, I don't care if he's in America, he reads from a Hebrew Bible. Yeah, they'll read English too if they don't know Hebrew that well, but they will, you know, it's still what they do there. We're going to look at verse uh, 30 here in just a second here. That's where I meant to be. Okay, let's, let's start right here with verse uh, 27. He that delighteth seeketh good, seeketh favor. But he that searcheth for evil, it shall come unto him. He that trusteth in riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a foliage. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the foolish shall be servant to the wise of heart. This is the interesting part. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that is wise winneth souls. That's pretty close translation. Just And you could translate it that way if you so desired. I'm not saying that you couldn't. But I'm going to tell you what you actually have written right here because it's very plain and very simple. Bari Tzedak or tzaddik, in this way, it's the way it's pronounced there. Bari tzaddik, which is righteous fruit. All right? Eitz chayim. Righteous fruit is the what? Tree of life. Why is it called a righteous fruit? It's the fruit of the womb. It's a child being born. Bari tzaddik. Eitz chayim. The righteous fruit is the tree of life. There is going to be a child born from a womb, a pari tzaddik. What did God say to Eve? Remember that? Let's jump back real quick. Let's just look at this. We don't want to miss this. And I will put enmity between thy, uh, between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Her seed is a child. It is a fruit of the womb. And you rabbis that want to fuss over the prophecy of Isaiah that says a virgin shall conceive. I know it says Adama. I know it's a young maiden. What do you think? The young maiden's not a virgin? The point is, is that the child in her womb will call, be called El Gibor, the mighty God. You don't call a child that is being born from the womb El Gibor. A prince of peace. And everybody is looking for the Mashiach to be a prince of war. He's a prince of peace. Okay? And what does it say here? That there's going to be enmity, hatred between Satan's children and that woman's child. Sure will be. All right? Now, let's go back over here to Proverbs 11 and let's look at this. All right? So, the parit tzaddik, it's a righteous fruit. It'll be a fruit of the womb. And that's the es chayim, and it will be the tree of life. Ve'lakach nefeshot chacham. What does that mean? You can say, see the word, the thing is, it doesn't say he in there to be in with. And he that is wise winneth souls. No, literally, you are saying that fruit, that righteous fruit, which is the tree of life, and will take the wise souls. That's what it says. In other words, the fruit of righteousness, which is the tree of life, he's coming to take the righteous souls, or the wise souls. That's what he's coming for those wise souls. I think it's an amazing, amazing, clearly a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Now, let's move on. We're going to go into Exodus chapter 2 real quick here. And some things I want to show, share with you. This Moses himself was a type of the coming of the Messiah. That's why he said, the, pro, the, the Lord thy God shall raise up a prophet liken unto me. Now, let's just look at this though. And when she could no longer hide him, this is Moses' mother at the time. We're looking here in Exodus chapter 2 here. She took 
for him an ark of bulrush and daubed it with slime and with pitch and she put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's bank and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him and the daughter of pharaoh came down to bathe in the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside and she saw the ark among the flags and sent her maiden to fetch it and she opened it and saw it even the child and behold a boy that wept and she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and she became her son, and she called his name Moses, Moshe, and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now this is the entire scene of Moses being placed into a basket, dog with pitch, is a type of the womb. Why? Because God formed Adam from what? The dust of the earth. God, then his mother, Moses' mother, takes and places him inside of this basket, places it in the, 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 uh, along the edge of the river's bank with the reeds. And Pharaoh's daughter comes out, finds the basket, and draws him from the water. What happens when the child comes from the womb? It, the water breaks forth. The child comes out. It is a type of the child would be in a womb. It is a type of the Messiah that he would come from a womb. And we're finding out what over in Proverbs that Solomon also noted the fact that the tree of life would be a righteous fruit. You know, that tree of life, that righteous fruit would do what? It would take many wise souls. Oh my gosh, friends, this is just amazing to me. Now, Let's get into the part about how do we see all this playing out in Scripture here. And that's what I want to take you to. Now we're going to go, my rabbinical friends, now let's take a serious look at what happens in the story of Jesus himself, Jesus of Nazareth here. In John chapter 4 here, it says, Then saith the woman of Samaria, remember Jesus, he's going, he's got, he says to his apostles, I have needs to go by Samaria. And while they're going into town to, to grab some food, he meets this woman at the well, and says, uh, says, comes up there, said, the, then said the woman, uh, he, he starts to talk with her, and he's asked her to bring, bring him a drink, and she says, here, you know, I'm a Samaritan, you know, uh, how is it that thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which, who am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. All right, why? Because the, in Israel, they're very racist. They didn't, have, they didn't want nothing to do with Samaritans. Why? They were not Jews. This is why we've not brought home the house of Israel today. It's because of this type of prejudice. That's all right. God knows this. Keep in mind, don't be angry with them. All right? Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is it that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. All right? Now in this case here, it's Zoe, the Greek word Zoe, which would be the same thing in Hebrew, the Ma'im Chayim, a water of life. Okay, what did Jeremiah say? They had forsaken the fountains of living water. All right. Then the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From hence hast thou that, that, that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, uh, sh sh give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He was that fruit of righteousness. He was the fountains of living water. That was to be that was forsaken by Israel. And here the God is telling the prophets, you know, trying to get them to understand what's going on. All right, now look at here. Exodus 17. Another type. Moses, not only is he a type of the Messiah, that he would be born in a, in a woman's womb and come out in this very name, Moshe, drawn from the water, was a prophecy. His very name prophesies the coming of a child would be from a womb. 
let alone the fact that the prophet Isaiah said unto us, a son is born, a child is given. His name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the El Gibor. Let alone that. All right? But what do we have here when we look at the rock that Moses struck? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, we're, we're over here in Exodus, what is this? Exodus 17, verse 3. Wherefore hast thou brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. <laughs> Same thing that you did with the Messiah. Same thing you did with Jesus when he came to Nazareth, ready to stone him. You think Moses had it any easier? No. Oh, today we say that we believe Moses. Do we really? And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people and take with you the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb. Now God himself is going to stand on the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so on the side of the elders of Israel. And the name of the place was called Masa and Mirabah because of the striving of the children of Israel because they tried the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? <laughs> Can you believe it? Now, God says to Moses what to do. And he does it. And the waters come forth. And that rock was a type of the Mashiach when he would come. That the rock itself would be smitten. That the elders of Israel would be gathered together. And when the rock was smitten, that the waters would come forth. Now, Jesus gave that sign to that woman at the well. If you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. All he did was give her a sign. A sign to look for. Let me show you what that sign was. Let me just show, share with you though. All right. Zechariah 12 also gave the same sign. And I will pour upon the house of David. Zechariah 12.10. Upon the heavens of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and upon supplication. They shall look unto, uh, unto me because they have thrust him through it. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. When he was thrust through, it was right there in his side, right next to his heart. And the water and the blood that came out was separated. It was showing that he was what? That he was the tree of life. He was the waters of life. He was the righteous fruit that, that Solomon wrote about in the book of Proverbs. He was the righteous fruit that was taken from the womb of his mother that Isaiah prophesied of. And like Moses in the book of Exodus, when his very name that was given to him, Moshe, drawn from the water, was also a type of the coming of the Messiah that he'd be taken from the womb. And then what did we have? When Christ was placed on the cross, that Roman soldier drove that spear into his side, and that water did come forth. And I wouldn't be surprised that that woman of Samaria wasn't there that day. And not only did the water come forth from his side to show that he was the tree of life and that the waters of life was flowing from him. And my rabbinical brethren, let me remind you as well, the temple itself, according to Rabbi Orly, was laid out like the human body. The Holy of Holies, he said, was where the human heart lay. And he even said that God intends for the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the, the Spirit of Almighty God, to dwell within us. And that fire that we spoke about in the beginning of the broadcast here, about the Ish and Isha, that fire of God, that was once in them was restored on the day of Pentecost. Because remember, Jesus told his apostles to wait until you're endued from, with power from on high. The waters of life, the tree of life, had come forth. And he had fulfilled his mission. And on the day of Pentecost, to prove that his mission had come forth, was there were cloven tongues likened to fire that rested upon each one of them. The miracle, friends, was that they all heard in their own language 
when only one language was being spoken. The cloven tongues was literally like a fire that came and rested on top of them, showing that what Adam and Eve had in the beginning, the Ish and the Isha, Remember, God taken in order to make her, he didn't take it from uh, Me Adam, he took it from Meesh, from that fire of God, and made Isha, another fire of God, a daughter of God, filled with Chaim. And they each one had Chai, separate, their own soul. They were both living souls with the very life from the tree of life. But that redemption process, this is why God had to put that block, let them not get back to the tree of life in that fallen state, because then you would have murderers that came into the earth later, like in the case of the fallen angels when they took, a, took and, and, and birthed children with the women, then they also would have had the tree of life had God not done something to make sure that that didn't happen. And then all the divination that would happen in the days of Israel and before and the people in the land as God said to Israel, don't do it in the likeness thereof. How they take and they're using all kinds of sorcery and they pass, uh, your, don't pass your own seed, your children through the fire to Molech. This is why that eternal life could not just be poured out as of yet. God had to clean up this world. He had to make Israel ready for the receiving of the fruit, that righteous fruit that righteous fruit that would restore the life of Almighty God to live back in us today. And my brethren and sisters that are listening, let me just tell you something. It's very easy to receive of that life. When you believe on Jesus Christ, when you receive Yeshua to be the Mashiach, and you accept what He has done and confess your sins, he will allow the waters that flowed that day to flow down upon you. In a water baptism, you wash your sins away. When you come forth, it's the same thing, like that child coming from the womb. Remember how Jesus said, except a man be born again? He said to Nicodemus, he cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. You come forth in that newness of life. And then, when you believe, you've confessed your sins, you've been baptized in His name, then God will fill you with the spirit of life. The Eitz Chaim will come upon you. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for watching. Share this message, my friends. If you're a Jewish brother or sister, you've heard this, you're still in the traditions of the Orthodox belief. If you want to talk to me privately, you can email me directly. Email me at stephenbenoon at gmail.com. Put in the subject line, though. Need to talk. I'm Jewish. I'll keep it confident. It'll just be between us. If there's anything I can do to help you. God bless you. We love you. Shalom.